creation, evolution, reincarnation. How did we get here? Hey, I've just got to tell you about my best friend, Jesus. He's the one that created the world. He was the active agent in creation, according to John 1 and Colossians 1 and Ephesians 3 and Hebrews 1. He is the one who created us. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what will make us happy and what will make us sad. He understands us because he's the one who created it all. How did he create it? Well, there's a record there in Genesis chapter one and chapter two, and it just goes through the days of creation. First day of creation, he created light by just letting himself shine. The second day, he created the firmament, the sky. The third day, he created dry ground and the vegetation. The fourth day, he created the sun and the, as the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night and the stars. And the fifth day, he created the birds of the air and the creatures of the waters and seas. And the sixth day, he created the land animals and then he made human beings. And he had that first marriage. He created marriage on the sixth day. And then on the seventh day, he did three special things. He rested, he blessed, and he made it holy that seventh day. That's how he created the world. Now, in that creation story in Genesis 1 and the first three verses of Genesis 2, the Hebrew word that's used in the original language is Elohim, meaning the powerful, majestic, and mighty God. But then there's kind of a second angle on the creation story in Genesis 2, verses 4 on up through 25, and the end of that. And there, there's a change in the term, the word, or the names used for God. It's Elohim Yahweh. Yahweh is the term that's used for God who is close, who is intimate, who is very involved in our lives. So the Lord wanted us to know that he is big enough to rule his mighty universe, yet close enough and small enough to live within our hearts, to be, be interested in our everyday experience. The creation story tells us about Jesus and his character and his power and his closeness. And then all the Bible writers echo that same thing. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it moved, it, it stood fast. And so all of the Bible writers recognized that truth about Jesus. And over here in, um, in Hebrews, we even find it says that by faith in Hebrews the, the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the things, that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So what do we do with this idea that somehow evolution was involved in this process? Well, what we have to recognize is that the Bible already explained that 2,000 years ago. Here in 2 Peter 3, we're told exactly what the problem is with that evolutionary theory. 2 Peter 3, verse 3, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. When somebody mocks you for believing that Jesus created the world, you can know that they are found right here in this verse of the Bible, that they are mocking and scoffing because they want to walk according to their own lusts. And what do they say? Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This concept of all things continuing as they were from the beginning is called uniformitarianism. Now, science does a lot of good to help society. 
because science observes the natural world. But there are two problems with the limits of science. First of all, science has to approach their study as if there is no God and there are no miracles. So they already rule out creation. The second is this thing called uniformitarianism. They approach it saying everything we see today is the way it has always been from the beginning. And yet we know from the Bible record there have been major changes to how God created a perfect world when there was sin that came in and later a flood that destroyed the world. So these scoffers that buy into uniformitarianism in terms of origins it's a good thing in terms of everyday science, but not in terms of origins. They will willingly deny three things because of their belief in uniformitarianism. Here they are. Verse 5, For they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water. They willfully forget there was creation by God. Second, Verse 6, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. Second thing they deny is a worldwide flood. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for the fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Third thing they deny is the universal destruction of sin and evil and a new earth being made. So we don't have to be surprised when we run into these theories. We can be thankful for science, but we realize the limits of science because they don't know about our best friend, Jesus, who created the world in six days and rested and blessed and sanctified the Sabbath day. So why don't you tell somebody today about Jesus and how he can speak and create worlds? Wouldn't that be awesome? <music>